Okay, thank you. It's a pleasure to see you all tonight. And um, please know there will be time for questions afterwards, so I'm interested for us to dialogue as we finish. Um, I'm going to be speaking tonight on the missionary preparation and vocation of Henry Martin. His dates are 1781 to 1812, and I do hope that you got a, um, a handout or an outline plus the quotes when you came in. That can serve to orient you as we go along. Since he's, he's mainly known through his journals and letters, there are a lot of quotes that I'll have from, from there as we go. So, one day, after Henry Martin had endured a caustic comment from his Muslim language helper, he admitted, quote, he sometimes cuts me to the very soul. That day, they had completed the translation of Jesus' parables into Urdu, the language of Indian Muslims. And Martin records, I asked Munshi, which is the word for language helper there, what he thought would be the success of it. And he said, with dreadful bitterness and contempt, that after the present generation should pass away, a set of fools would perhaps be born, such as the gospel required, who would say, this is the word of God, and would believe that God is man and man God. Cut to the soul indeed, is what I think. Martin's helper doubted that anyone from his culture would acknowledge Jesus' words as God's words, or affirm that Jesus Christ is in some way identified with God. So Martin declares in the same letter, he says, quote, The cause we undertake is, if possible, more odious and contemptible in the eyes of the people of this country than it was in the primitive times, that is, in apostolic times. Martin was then 26 years old and serving as a military chaplain in northern India. This exchange displays his tenacious and personal adaptability by which he sought to make the gospel known in a new culture. Now, 21st century Americans, uh, and especially 21st century American evangelicals, can be excused for not knowing the name of Henry Martin. He was a Pado baptist Anglican, who was employed as a chaplain for the East India Company, and whose ministry in India and Persia encompassed just six years before his death of sickness at age 31. Now, you re may remember his appearance in John Piper's Let the Nations Be Glad as an example of suffering in missions, or perhaps the volume of his journals and letters published shortly after his death by his college friend John Sargent, which is the most well-known biography from the, from the earlier 1800s. But evangelicals in the 19th century would not have shared our general unfamiliarity with Martin. Interest in Martin for his deep spirituality and the romance of his short life entered the imagination of the evangelical movement in Great Britain to the extent that several editions of his journals and letters were published during the 19th century. Martin's most recent interpreter calls Sargent's uh, account of Martin's life, quote, the most influential missionary biography of the century, end quote. In addition, his story was so familiar that he inspired, that his story inspired the character of St. John or St. John Rivers, the missionary and suitor to Charlotte Bronte's Jane Eyre, which we'll examine later. How then should we approach him nearly 212 years after his death? Now, to give some perspective, as he lay dying of sickness in eastern Turkey on October 12, uh, pardon me, October 16, 1812, Napoleon was enjoying the capture of Moscow before his disastrous return during the Russian winter. James Madison and the Americans were reeling after their failed invasion of Canada in the War of 1812. We kind of try to forget we did that, right? That's the War of 1812. Jane Austen's Sense and Sensibility had been published the year before, and Pride and Prejudice would come out the following year. To say the least, Martin is not a contemporary figure for us. While much can be gained from the spiritual insights of Martin's journals, I will focus tonight specifically on how Martin's education and formation prepared him for his unique ministry role. I believe such a study could give us insight into how the church today should cultivate and send cross-cultural missionaries. In short, Henry Martin's Calvinistic evangelical formation, on the one hand, and his Cambridge classical education, on the other hand, 
combined to give him an extraordinary ability to manage translations of the New Testament and to witness creatively in different cultures. By examining here the day-to-day ministry of Henry Martin, we can cut through several caricatures of him, either as a romantic missionary hero or as a self-absorbed idealist whose singular passion rode over the affections of other people, including the woman he hoped to marry. That's a teaser, because there is some romance in this story. Okay, be ready for that. Instead, we see a man patiently working for the glory of God at what he could do best, even when it led him to a dangerous journey amid his failing health. Now, there's no question about his significance for the missionary movement and the modern missionary movement in the early 19th uh, century. Martin oversaw and edited the first translation of the New Testament into Urdu, a text which was published shortly after his death and served as the basis for all Urdu Bible translations during the next century. And to today, uh, Urdu is spoken by at least 230 million people today, mostly in Pakistan. Second, In a furious year of work, he completely retranslated the New Testament into Persian after an initial version proved incomprehensible to native speakers. And then finally, although he was restricted in his cross-cultural preaching ministry in India because of governmental restrictions, that is like English governmental restrictions, not Indian ones, Despite being restricted, at least one man who heard him was converted and became the first Muslim background Anglican priest in India. So we will give an overview of Martin's life and ministry, then examine two misleading portraits of him, one negative and the other a combination of positive ones. And then finally, we'll offer some evidence of Martin's tenacious flexibility as a recommendation for today. So let's begin with his life and ministry then. His life and ministry. Martin's life, Henry Martin's life, just like Gaul, can be divided into three parts. One, his preparation for ministry culminating in his departure for India in 1805. Then his ministry in India from 1806 to 1811. And finally, his ministry in Persia for a year and a half before his death in 1812. So first, about his education and formation. Henry Martin was born into a prosperous and hardworking family in southwest England. However, his mother died when he was young, and both he and his two sisters suffered from tuberculosis their entire lives. We forget the seriousness of tuberculosis in our day, uh, but it was considered the leading cause of death in England in the year 1800, the year that Martin's father died when he was 18 years old. Like David Brainerd, whom Martin deeply admired, Martin suspected that his time on this earth would be short. Martin received the best education available in his town and then qualified to study at St. John's College, Cambridge. He distinguished himself by winning the prize as Chief Wrangler, not a rodeo sport, okay, not a rodeo sport, Chief Wrangler, which meant and still means today the top student in mathematics at a time when Cambridge was considered at the top school for mathematics. Now, lest we think his skills one-sided, he also won a prize in Latin composition. He was appointed fellow of his college after he graduated and served as examiner for two years for upcoming seniors behind him. In addition to examining students in works of philosophy, he also tested them on their knowledge of Xenophon's Anabasis in Greek. His journal often records, as on a day in 1803, quote, I read Hebrew and then Greek, and then the Greek of the epistle to the Hebrews. It was sort of a normal day in ministry training for Henry Martin. So that was his classical training, a distinct privilege in the early 1800s and a tool that he carried into ministry. In regard to his spiritual life, he began to take seriously the things of God after the death of his father in 1800. He decided to read scripture and found himself enveloped in the narrative of the book of Acts. Then, as he records for his sister, who was a very pious woman, had been encouraging her brother to pursue the Lord, he wrote her this, quote, I began to attend more diligently to the words of our Savior in the New Testament and to devour them with delight. When the offers of mercy and forgiveness were made so freely, I supplicated to be made partaker of the covenant of grace with eagerness and hope, 
and thanks be to the ever-blessed Trinity for not leaving me without comfort. That marks his conversion shortly after his father's death uh, in about 1800. Now, this religious awakening met encouragement through the pastor Charles Simeon, who's about 20 years older than Henry Martin. Simeon was pastor of Holy Trinity Church in Cambridge and a strong advocate of evangelical Anglicanism. He was a lifelong bachelor and trained up many young men for ministry, including Henry Martin. He invited undergraduates to his home on Friday nights and taught preaching on Sunday afternoons. He was also one of the founders of the Church Missionary Society, which is the Anglican missionary arm that still exists today. So Martin's reading list from these days of spiritual formation was focused on the English Puritans and their heirs up to his day. Besides Richard Baxter and Jonathan Edwards, he read contemporaries such as American American Samuel Hopkins. His belief in the sovereignty of God and his identity as an Anglican evangelical became evident to everyone, and most notably when he arrived in India several years later. So jumping ahead a little bit on this. But when he arrived in India, as an Anglican pastor, he was invited to preach in the Anglican church in Calcutta. He took as his text on one of the first Sundays he was in India, 1 Corinthians 1, 23 through 24. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Now, we don't actually have the sermon. The sermon manuscript doesn't exist. But he records in his journal that the next week another pastor preached in direct opposition to him. The, this man argued, according to Martin, and here's Martin's terms in his journal, quote, so this man's, ref, Martin's now reflecting what the man said about his preaching, okay? He says, quote, to say that repentance is the gift of God was to induce men to sit still and wait for God. To teach that nature was wholly corrupt was to lead men to despair, and that men thinking the righteousness of Christ sufficient to justify will account it unnecessary to have any of their own. End quote. Now, the preacher who is thus maligned for believing in one sermon, in the effectual call, total depravity, and justification by faith alone, can usually, or I believe, take some solace that he is approaching the truth. Okay, so that is Martin's Calvinist convictions uh, on display. Unless we think that the young Henry Martin was still in what we call his Calvinist cage stage, his journal records that he partook of the Lord's Supper that day in peace. He records it this way. He says, quote, I re-, this is in the same text, I rejoiced at having the sacrament of the Lord's Supper afterwards, as the solemnities of that blessed ordinance sweetly tended to soothe the asperities and dissipate the contempt which was rising. So he's a, a young man, like 25, 26 years old, who has his, his asperities soothed by taking the Lord's Supper after being maligned. Martin believed deeply in God's sovereignty and practiced it in prayer. He prayed for the conversion of men and women in India. Here's what he said. He says on, on one, one instance, quote, My whole soul wrestled with God. I knew not how to leave off urging with him the fulfillment of his promise, chiefly pleading his own glorious power. So from the evidence of his reading list, his prayers, and the controversy he occasioned, it's clear that by the time Martin traveled to India, he possessed a settled and confident trust in God's sovereignty. Now Martin's missionary calling, switching back to Cambridge again, solidified through discussion with Charles Simeon. Here's how Martin's biographer records his missionary awakening. He says this, The immediate cause of Martin's determination to undertake the office of missionary was hearing a remark from Mr. Simeon on the benefit which had resulted from the services of a single missionary in India, that is, William Carey. His attention was thus arrested, and his thoughts occupied with the vast importance of the subject. Soon after this, perusing the life of David Brainerd, his soul was filled with a holy emulation of that extraordinary man, And after deep consideration and fervent prayer, he was at last fixed in a resolution to imitate his example. So once set on his course, Martin still wrestled in his journal with what this might entail. He actually had worries about what would it mean for me to be a missionary. He found that his picture of missionary work looked like monotony. 
monotony. He said, quote, the thought that I must be unceasingly employed in the same kind of work amongst poor, ignorant people is what my proud spirit revolts at. His future to him looked like a, quote, vast, uninteresting wilderness, end quote. Now, those wor worries, thankfully, did not last once he arrived in India and began to struggle with the unending task of making the gospel clear to people who are misinformed or ignorant of it. So Simeon then became Martyr's ment uh, Martin's mentor and advocate as he prepared for cross-cultural ministry. Martin served as curate or assistant pastor to Simeon and also studied Urdu from the foremost uh, scholar at Cambridge who could speak Urdu. Simeon introduced Martin to the principal advocates of evangelical reform and missions at that time, including William Wilberforce and the then very elderly John Newton. In all, Simeon and his circle helped launch several aspiring young men into overseas ministry, including Martin's college friend and colleague, uh, a colleague eventually in India, Daniel Corey. As they explored ways for Martin to go to India, Simeon and Martin settled on the idea of applying as an East India Company chaplain. Martin was obliged to support his sister since their father had died, and the East India Company paid very well for those who were willing to live and work in India. Now, this raises some significant questions. The ethics of working for the East India Company is a topic for another day, but let's just picture what that really means, okay? We can imagine something similar to the arrangement between the British Empire and the East India Company if we were to imagine today that the United States government gave Amazon.com an exclusive trade monopoly over the entire Amazon River Basin in Brazil so that it would literally become Amazon, right? Okay, this is... Amazon, in consequence, then formed its own army and navy to enforce its oversight of the Amazon River Basin and, hired, and then hired chaplains to minister to the Americans serving in this private army. That's the company Henry Martin signed up to work for when he joined the East India Company. All we can say now, and you, we can talk about it afterwards, is that Henry Martin did not agree with EIC rule in India, but he chose to participate as a chaplain, which he believed to be an honorable calling, and to use it very intentionally as a springboard for missions, as a springboard for cross-cultural missions. The final factor in Martin's preparation was his decision to leave for India single, even though he had deep affection for a woman, Lydia Grenfell. Martin reveals in his letters and journals that Charles Simeon had advised him to go to India single, even while the august members of the London Eclectic Society, which was a gathering of Anglican ministers, told him he was a fool not to be married first. Even, and even assuming Lydia was fully willing, her mother was deeply opposed, and so although he, Martin spent his last day in England with Lydia and her family and, and, and other family members, because uh, Lydia's sister had married Henry Martin's cousin, so they were acquainted. He, he spent his last day with them. He did not propose to her before he left. But that determination lasted only through his journey to India. After meeting his new colleagues in Calcutta, and after an earnest sit-down talk with the Baptist missionaries in Serampore, Martin then proposed to Lydia by letter two months after arriving in India. Lydia, un uh, unfortunately or fortunately, rejected his pro proposal. She rejected his proposal on the grounds of her mother's opposition. Martin accepted this, but several years later, he began the correspondence with Lydia again, and it continued until their death, until his death, pardon me. He wrote to her before beginning his final journey in which he planned to return to England. He said this, quote, soon we shall have occasion for pen and ink no more, but I trust I shall shortly see thee face to face. Love to all the saints, believe me to be yours, ever most faithfully and affectionately, Henry Martin. So Martin's preparation then consisted in a high degree of academic success, matched by a spiritual formation among a fervent group of evangelical Anglicans. He immersed himself in languages and in reading spiritual classics, including the Puritans and Jonathan Edwards. He served in ministry to a village outside Cambridge and accepted a position as chaplain to the East India uh, Company to, English, to serve English people living in India. 
He deeply regretted his decision to leave without proposing to Lydia, and his hopes for love between them, from his end, did not diminish. So that's his preparation. Next up is his ministry in India. So Henry Martin was appointed as chaplain to East India Company soldiers living in northern India, where they were enforcing an ever-expanding company rule over local Indians, both Hindus and Muslims. Once deployed as the lone chaplain within 100 miles, he held services for the soldiers, eventually held services for Hindi and Urdu-speaking sp wives or consorts of the soldiers, and then also for a small group of earnest believers among the soldiers and their families on Sunday evenings. Then he would travel far and wide to perform um, weddings and, and baptisms for the British soldiers. But his passion from his first day in India was for cross-cultural evangelism. His fellow missionaries immediately recognized his gifts, and within four months, within four months of arrival in India, as he made his way up the Ganges River to his station, he was already translating the Book of Acts into Urdu. Martin and the other like-minded chaplains made plans to reach local people in India. They, founded, they formed small grammar schools where a blend of Indian languages and English could be uh, studied. He preached to a group of beggars and holy men or, you know, sort of or Hindu older men who had renounced the world and were sort of mendicants under the guise of a rice donation for some time. He longed to begin an itinerant ministry, that is, to undertake open-air preaching tours. But company duties demanded time, and Martin discovered that translation was a long-term project that involved many starts and stops. So he employed a series of munchies, that is, Indian language helpers, who would give a rough translation of passages from the New Testament and then engage in dialogue with Martin about whether the proper sense was communicated. The quote at the beginning of this, this paper was one of these engagements, and, and this became Martin's sweet spot. He writes, quote, all day at translation, after being occupied a good while at night in considering difficult passages in Ephesians, I went to bed full of astonishment at the wonders of God's word. Never did I see anything of the strength and beauty of the language and importance of the thoughts as I do now. So translation helped him encounter the text of Scripture in a fresh way. So over the course of three years, Martin worked with several language helpers on both the Urdu and the Persian New Testaments, which are written in similar script. That's how you could, he could do both of those. His Urdu helper, Mirza Fitrat, proved invaluable as a translator and was eventually acknowledged when it was published as kind of co-editor. His helper for Persian was an Arab named Sabat, who was a convert to Christianity from, from Islam, but who proved to be very difficult to get along with and arrogant about his own competence. Martin averred that he, Martin, was the only European in India who could live and work with Sabat's arrogance, moodiness, and his torpor, his laziness. By 1810, however, Martin's health was failing. If he preached on a Sunday, he would have a deep pain in his chest for several days. He had frequent fevers, and the excessive heat caused him to lose his appetite. So he traveled back to Calcutta after four years of ministry in India with the completed Urdu New Testament and a draft of the Persian New Testament in hand. So that's, that's the four years in India in brief compass. Then we come to the ministry in Persia for 18 months. So in January of 1811, Martin was sick and believed the best thing would be to leave India. He proposed to sail for Persia and present his translation to leaders there. When he arrived at the, por the port of Boucher in, uh, in, in, in southern Iran today, the, 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 um, the, the port city there, Sabat's translation of the Persian was widely ridiculed, and Martin realized that he did not have a Persian translation in any sense. And so he started over. Thus began a year of translation and travel. He was invited as a guest to the city of Shiraz, where he undertook retranslating the New Testament. As the only foreigner present in the city, he attracted attention and visitors, many of whom were eager to talk about matters of religion. After four years of constant dialogue with his language helpers, um, he was prepared for this. He was invited to public audiences with Muslim clerics and was expected to have an answer not only for Christianity, but for speculative philosophical topics as well. So here's one example. 
On one occasion, his host made objections against the earth's motion around the sun. This is about Copernican revolution stuff here. Um, he, Martin says he made the objection, quote, with as much spleen as if he had an estate which he was afraid would run, a, run away from him. It's a very early 1800s <laughs> aristocratic joke, I feel like, right? The, he had, with as much spleen as if he had a piece of land that was going to run away from him. I don't know what that means, but Martin describes his response. He says this, quote, I explained our system to Aga Akbar, that is the Copernican system, but there were many things not to be understood without diagrams. So a scribe in waiting was ordered to produce his implements, and I was obliged to show him first the sections of the cone, okay, conic sections, trigonometry, right? Okay. And how a body revolves, around an, revolves in an ellipse around the sun in one focus, etc. He knew nothing of mathematics, as I suspected, so it was soon found useless to proceed, he comprehending nothing, end quote. Now, I, would, I imagine many of us would have difficulty proving the Earth's elliptical orbit around the sun if we were asked to do so on stage today, so that is not an appropriate question after the lecture today to me, right? Okay. But apparently Martin's status as top math student at Cambridge came in handy at this point. Okay, this is the sort of guy he was. Now, let me, let me get to some, some more um, spiritual interaction he had. These conversations honed his thoughts on Muslim apologetics. So he reports one day that two young men from the college who were, quote, full of zeal and logic came this morning to try me with hard questions. So after deflecting their speculative questions about the nature of bodies and souls, right, spirit and, 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 and matter, they asked Martin why the ministry and miracles of Jesus had more authority than those of Muhammad. So he responded, quote, you will be pleased to observe a difference between your books and ours. Our narrators were eyewitnesses. Yours are not, nor nearly so, end quote. One of the young men returned the next day, but, quote, as soon as he heard the word Father in the translation of the New Testament they were working on, used for God, he laughed and went away, end quote. As is clear from these interactions, Martin had learned to stay calm amid questioning, not to be drawn in by metaphysical speculation about the nature of bodies and souls. I have another illustration about the, the, the um, uh, 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 in particular, about the origin of evil, which he wasn't, he, he, he deftly avoided. And he had determined his own apologetic route in relation to Islam. He stressed the picture of Jesus that we gain from the Gospels and urged his hearers to evaluate whether these Gospels were making genuine historical claims. So he honed his apologetic task with Islam during these uh, 10 months in Shiraz. When the Persian New Testament was complete in May of 1812, he set off for the capital of Tehran to present it to the Shah or king of Iran. After a grueling journey, Mar they, he was traveling about 32 miles a day on horseback. So I, I estimated from here to St. Louis in about 25 days on horseback. So that's, that's what he did to get to, to, to Tehran. Martin learned that he could have no audience with the Shah without a letter from the British consul, like the British ambassador, who unfortunately resided in the city of Tabriz nearly 400 miles further. So he arrived in Tabriz on July 5th of that summer and was immediately taken to bed with weakness and a dangerously high fever. He had been ill-provisioned on this journey so that he even reports in his journal, quote, we had, now, we had now eaten nothing for two days. My mind was much disordered from headache and giddiness from which I was seldom free, but my heart, I trust, was with Christ and his saints, end quote. Martin left the Persian New Testament with the British consul after recovering briefly, and after recovering briefly, he made the decision to head for England on his own. But he was, of course, in northern Iran. It's very far inland. Several countries were at war at the time, and the only way to get to safety was to travel overland to Constantinople. It was a very long journey. So we cannot under understate the difficulty of these final six weeks. He traveled as the lone foreigner across unfamiliar lands with guides who were not particularly friendly. He chose to spend his nights in the stables so that he could be out of reach from the curiosity of people in the villages. 
His journal records, now this is interesting, how he meditated on Scripture even as he rode a horse in basically of a, a fever delirium. He says, quote, I scarcely perceived that we had been moving. A Hebrew word in the 16th Psalm, having led me gradually into speculations on the eighth conjugation of the Arabic verb, I am glad that my philological curiosity is revived as my mind will be less, idle, uh, less liable to idleness, end quote. Now, scholars have speculated about the nature of these linguistic speculations, and let me tell you, we, I, I don't know really what's going on here either, what he's thinking about, but amid his thoughts on grammar were also meditations on the text of Scripture. So four days later, he, he, he records, all day at the village, writing down notes on the 15th and 16th Psalms, and then his final j- journal entry, 10 days before his death, reflects his thoughts on heaven. He says this, quote, I sat in the orchard and thought, with sweet comfort and peace of my God. In solitude my company, my friend and comforter. Oh, when shall time give place to eternity? When shall appear that new heaven and new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness? End quote. We do not know the details of his death, but he succumbed to sickness ten days later in the city of Tokat, Turkey. Interestingly enough, an Armenian Christian who was accompanying him carried his journals to, to Constantinople, and they were eventually sent back to England and then published several years later. Henry Martin was 31 years old at the time. So that's his life. Now, I'd like to take the next stage and look at a couple different perspectives in the legacy of Henry Martin in the 19th century that we need to wade through in order then to draw conclusions for ourselves today. So two portraits of Henry Martin, one positive, one, one negative, and one positive. So four years after Martin's death, John Sargent published his biography based largely on his journals and letters. Now, Sargent loved his old college friend and spared him criticism almost entirely. The only exception I have found in Sargent's biography was when Martin preached two weeks in a row on hell while aboard ship even after the sailors had vowed not to attend the service if the topic was again eternal punishment. And at that point, John Sargent says, we might question the wisdom of Henry Martin in deciding to preach hell two weeks in a row after they they threatened to boycott. So I will point out one negative portrayal of Martin in his legacy and then two positive portrayals, but both of these illustrate the need for discernment as we seek to learn from Henry Martin. And both, as might be expected, involved his romance with Lydia Grenfell. So here they are. Number one, a consuming love, St. John Rivers in Jane Eyre. Although Charlotte Bronte does not say so explicitly, it is believed that the character St. John Rivers in Jane Eyre is based on Henry Martin. St. John has a consuming love for Jane, an impossible ideal in which he envisions the two of them sacrificed on an altar of missionary service. But this is not the willing martyrdom of people complete in Christ and rejoicing in one another through marriage. He views her as an instrument or as an extension of his own missionary work. And Jane realizes that St. John's love is suffocating. She says this, Oh, St. John, I cried, have some mercy. I appealed to one who, in the discharge of what he believed his duty, knew neither mercy nor remorse. He continued, this is St. John speaking, God in nature intended you for a missionary's wife. It is not personal, but mental endowments they have given you. You are formed for labor, not for love. A missionary's wife, you must, you shall be, you shall be mine. I claim you, not for my pleasure, but for my sovereign's service. I almost thought he might say, my precious there, but he doesn't. The confusion between what belongs to God and what belongs to Sinjin is very palpable in this text. You can hear it right there. And, fr- and from the following chapter, Jane reflects, she says, I felt how, if I were his wife, this good man, pure as the deep sunless source, could soon kill me without drawing from my veins a single drop of blood or receiving on his own crystal conscience the faintest stain of crime. Now, to see Henry Martin's proposal to Lydia as such a consuming love is to misunderstand his and her sense of Christian duty. But his proposal to Lydia does reflect the mutual benefit they would be to each other in ministry. And here's what he wrote in 1806. So this is in his, his, his letter proposing to, to Lydia. He says, quote, I can only say 
that if you have a desire of being instrumental in establishing the blessed Redeemer's kingdom among these poor people, and will condescend to do it by supporting the spirits and animating the zeal of a weak messenger of the Lord, who is apt to grow very dispirited and languid, then come, and the Lord be with you, end quote. And then in his private journal, just after sending his proposal, Henry believes marriage will free him from some burdens of society by allowing him the security of a devoted wife and home. Now, this is from his private journal, but here's what he wrote just after he sent the, um, the proposal to Lydia. Quote, The agreeable female society I meet with in India is very dangerous to me by producing a softness of mind and indisposition to solitude and bold exertion. Thou, therefore, endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ, 2 Timothy 3.3. I felt through mercy my danger so near that I determined without hesitation to be as little as possible in the enjoyment of these two pleasing comforts, which are so enervating. What very, very little desire have I for marriage, except when I recollect that Lydia will, I hope, be such a one that I may live as independent as if single." One suspects and hopes that a year of marriage and perhaps a closer reading of 1 Corinthians 7, 33-34 would have taught Martin that no one should live as independent as if single once they are married, okay? But the evidence in Martin's life does not paint him in the self-absorbed way that St. John Rivers uh, desires Jane. Martin recognized his faults, including the desire for applause and praise. He opens his mind to close friends in his letters. He pursues ministry beyond his comfort zone and obvious strengths, including setting up a grammar school and preaching to mendicants and beggars. He found great encouragement from the small group of devout English men and women who gathered for prayer on Sunday evenings. And despite his protestations, he respected Lydia's decision and never forced the guilt trip on her that St. John Rivers foists on Jane. Henry Martin, as he himself knew and confessed, was far from perfect, but his love, as evidenced by his many other relationships, I don't believe was of this consuming kind. So that's, that's Charlotte Bronte's picture of him. A second set of, of impressions of him comes what, what I'll call a condescending glory, the valid Victorian idolization of Henry Martin. A second unfortunate presentation of Henry Martin was his status as a missionary hero in the 19th century. In the 1830s, Sir James Stevens declared that the name of Martin was, quote, here comes, in fact, the one heroic name which adorns the Church of England's annals from the days of Elizabeth to our own. That's pretty high praise. And Martin's biographer, George Smith, remarks that his journals will be seen on a level with Augustine's Confessions and Bunyan's Grace Abounding. Now, I suggest that there may be a temptation, especially in Victorian England, to make Henry Martin into the lone man defending the truth against barbarians, a sort of Horatius at the gate for modern missions. And I'm going to give you two examples of that. We can see two examples of this, both from the year 1871. The first comes in a collection of missionary stories called Pioneers and Founders by Charlotte Young. Young quotes the reminiscence of a Mrs. Mary Sherwood, who was part, very interesting, of Henry Martin's Sunday evening small group while her husband and she lived in India. Mrs. Sherwood recounts the day that Martin began preaching to the mendicants and holy men. She says, Quote, no dream, says Mrs. Sherwood, in the delirium of a raging fever could surpass the realities of their appearance. Every countenance foul and frightful with evil passions, the lips black with tobacco or crimson with henna. And then Charlotte Young, the author, comments, quote, the assemblage, in contrast with the pure, innocent, pale face and white dress of the preacher who addressed them, must have been like some of Gustave Doré's illustrations. And to make the effect full, she includes a Doré-esque illustration, which you'll see right here. Okay, so here it is. Our Doré-esque illustration, you can see Henry Martin standing up amid all the um, sort of Hindu um, holy men who look rather bedraggled with their knotty hair and um, falling off clothes and things like that. So 
an assembly of Hindu holy men or beggars might have looked similar to this in 1809. I don't, I don't know for a fact what that would have looked like. But looking at this type of picture and hearing that quote, the overtone of civilized to uncivilized, as well as the contrast between dark and light, is frankly difficult to read and overly exalts Martin's work as a sort of uh, a, a lone man standing against a, a dark world. Second example. Second example comes from a rather soupy novel called Her Title of Honor by Holm Lee, which is a pen name. Her Title of Honor. It tells Martin's story through the hero named Frank Gwynne, also in the year 1871. Lydia Grenfell is portrayed with the thoroughly romantic name Miss Trevelyan. Okay, Miss Trevelyan. So here's a conversation between Frank, who is Henry Martin, and a friend of his who will soon be married. They, the friend is about to get married. He says, Then it is decided. Miss Trevelyan will not go to India, says Cardin, his friend. His own joy sobered in sympathy with Frank's evident trouble and disappointment, keenly renewed at the moment by the spectacle of Cardin's satisfaction. Henry Martin, or Francis, says, quote, It is as bad as decided. She will not go. I dared not urge it, and I try not to regret it. If it must be so, doubtless it is for the best. End quote. Now, the story concludes with the author's comment that Miss Trevelyan had the honor, because it's her title of honor, the honor of being loved by the missionary Frank Gwynne, or Henry Martin, but that, that her honor would have been greater had she consented to marry him. Okay, so it's a sort of looking down on her for having turned him down. So here are two pictures of Henry Martin drawn to emphasize moral lessons. One of the lone missionary standing amid a crowd of darkened people, the other on the elevated status of the missionary life in God's kingdom. Each is recommended by pious evangelical authors who hope to stir up a holy emulation of Martin's faith and calling. Yet each perhaps participates in some of the blind spots of their own age, whether the lone warrior mentality, whether the great man idea, either, perhaps some racism in there, or of the set-apartness of missionary life. And so this leads us to reevaluate how best to appropriate the witness of Henry Martin today. So, so how will we appropriate him today? If he is not the lone ray of light in the midst of darkness, or an example of the exalted status of the missionary vocation, how ought we to understand and appropriate Martin today? I'll give, I'll give three, three guidelines for this. First, his teamwork. Second, his adaptability. And then third, his linguistic competence. His linguistic competence, all under the term tenacious flexibility. First, Martin was never a Lone Ranger missionary, but cultivated close relationships with a team. We do well to note Martin's dense network of friends and colleagues. Charles Simeon nurtured his faith and ministry. He not only provided ministerial training, but also worked tirelessly to help send Martin to India and worried about him as long as he was in India. In addition, most of the letters from Martin are addressed to his two colleagues in the chaplaincy, David Brown and Daniel Corey. With, with Corey especially, he discussed and dreamed about ministry ventures, while they also reminded each other not to burn out their strength in the Indian heat. Corey went on to serve in India for more than 30 years. We should also not overlook Martin's interaction with the Baptist missionaries, with William Carey, Joshua Marshman, and William Ward. William Carey reportedly said they need not send a missionary to whatever area Martin settled in. In his first months in Calcutta, Martin learned, that these three uh, learned from these three brothers about ministry in India. They and others often met for prayer in Serampore, where the three Baptists live. Marshman even encouraged Martin to remain in Calcutta to, quote, be ready, as Martin records in his journal, quote, to supply the place of Carey and Marshman in the work should they be taken off. Right, they're very aware of how close death is, right? So he's saying, you can take our place in all these translation efforts that we're undergoing, un un ongoing. Now, despite ecclesiastical differences, and Martin was a convinced Anglican, he learned from and partnered with the Baptist missionaries. So he commented, it, he, as, he, as he began his journey upriver, the group of missionaries near Calcutta met for prayer. 
And he remembers that day vividly in his journal, transcribed in a letter. So here's what it says, quote, the Baptist, he gives the list of the people there. The Baptist missionaries, then Mr. DeGrange, who was another English miss- missionary, some of their wives, Mr.s Brown, Parson, and Corey, who were the East India Company chaplains, and old Captain Wicks, who was an American sea captain, showed up at this prayer meeting, praise the Lord, okay, met at my pagoda this evening for the purpose of commending me to the grace of God before my departure. My soul never before had such divine enjoyment. Mr. Brown opened the prayer meeting, DeGrange followed, then I prayed. Afterwards, Marshman and Corey closed it in a prayer which acted like a strong cordial to my heart. Even now, my dear cousin, while I transcribe, my spirit is again kindled at the recollection of this memorable day. The missionaries were not without disagreements, but this episode reminds us that Martin relied on and thanked God for the close friendships of friends, of, of, of friends and colleagues. Second, his adaptability. Martin adapted his lifestyle and work to the needs before him. Translation was Martin's primary cross-cultural task, and this required significant creativity and adaptability. For instance, he reports that in, in translating into Urdu, he could find no written Urdu prose against which to compare his translation. Like, there's no prose written in, in Urdu. There was only poetry. He reported that his difficulties would be, he said, quote, considerably lessened were there any prose compositions in the language of acknowledged purity. But unfortunately, no such standard exists. No works of any description indeed have been found but poems. So he set himself the task of producing a readable, accessible prose New Testament with the help of a competent Indian Muslim translator. As we have seen, the daily work and interaction was never simple. It involved a constant dialogue about the truth of the gospel, even as he was seeking for words with which to express that gospel. The dialogue with his Indian Muslim helpers was also, for Martin, an internal dialogue. He was struck by the profound otherness of his missionary context and sought by any means possible to bring the truth of the gospel to bear upon it. And that was no easy task. To make a new truth understandable in a second language requires a giving of oneself to that task. Historian Kenneth Cragg concludes, quote, in Henry Martin, translator, the Christian thing was finding itself in words, which, as a diligent linguist, he was translating into character, end quote. The Christian thing was finding itself in words. Now, that's the language of linguistic theory regarding the reality of a thing coming to expression in the words of a, of a speaker and inhabiting, in a sense, the character of that speaker. But it is no different than what the Apostle Paul declares plainly in 1 Thessalonians 2.8 when he says, So, being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also ourselves, because you have become very dear to us. Sharing his own self was a necessary condition of bringing the gospel for the Apostle Paul and so also here for Henry Martin. Such ministry opens one up to people who will cut uh, cut one, quote, to the very soul, as he said earlier in this this dialogue, as we've already seen. Whereas the young Henry Martin worried about the monotony, the monotony of cross-cultural preaching, the task of translating the message required his full energy and talents. So missiologist Andrew Walls said about translation that it is, quote, both a reflection of the central act on which the Christian faith depends, that is the incarnation, and a concretization of the commission which Christ gave his disciples. Perhaps no other specific activity more clearly represents the mission of the church, end quote. And for us today, while the task of translating the scriptures into new languages continues, the vast majority of people in the world can access a readable copy of the scriptures if they so desire and they have a mobile phone. So what then is left? I think we should view all cross-cultural ministries of evangelism, teaching, instruction, and discipleship as falling within this central act of translation. To bring the Christian gospel to expression so that people understand it 
or to perform the drama of redemption in fresh ways that connect with and then subversively fulfill the religious desires of people is the central act of cross-cultural ministry. Whether in verbal conversation or in written translation, missionaries today need the same adaptability that Martin possessed in order to address the spiritual needs of the concrete people sitting right across from them. And then third for today, linguistic competence. Linguistic competence. Martin knew how to study languages. Martin made no apology for his education, but believed it was a gift to be cultivated and used. He had had early training in the classical languages and studied with the foremost scholar of Hindustani for six months before leaving England. His gift for languages was immediately recognized by the Baptists in Serampore, and he was entrusted with the Urdu translation. Now, Martin's education set him apart, notably from the primarily self-taught William Carey. Martin's most recent commentator remarks, quote, Martin's qualifications in Greek and Latin gave him a foundation as a translator that the Baptist missionaries, despite great zeal, could not match. And Martin recognized this. He wrote about the early drafts of what was then a Hindi translation effort from Serampore, not when he worked on, but he was, looking, he was editing it. Quote, he writes in a letter, many important sentences are wholly lost from faults in the order or other small mistakes. The errors of the press are also very considerable. Remind them, though not from me, that the more haste, the worst speed. The more haste, the worst speed, right? Slow down the printing press. So we make this right. Now, one wonders why Martin did not want the suggestion to come from him. <laughs> Maybe he had offered one too many suggestions already to the Baptist missionaries in Serampore who were running the printing press. But whatever may be the case, he was determined that Bible translations must reach the widest audience possible. In a moment of candor to his Cambridge friend John Sargent, Martin complains that not enough Cambridge-educated Anglicans would come to join the work. So he says... This is a bit jarring. Quote, I have grievous complaints to make that the immense work of translating the services into the languages of the East is left to dissenters, that is, to the Baptists, who cannot, here comes, who cannot in 10 years supply the want of what we gain by a classical education. End quote. Now, William Carey had 13 years more experience in, in, or experience in India before Martin arrived. So that might allow us to say they were at least equals by this point in 1807 when, when he said this. But it is no secret that the ambitious plans for translations by the Serampore Three, the Serampore Baptists, meant that those early Bibles went through several editions before they were easily understood by local people. So I leave Carrie and Martin to work out their linguistic differences in order to draw a final application for today. Outside the focused work of Bible translation organizations, linguistic competence is not a strong suit of American ministerial or missionary training on the whole. Uh, Matt Rhodes has re recently called for regaining, quote, professionalism in missions against the default assumption inherited from later mission efforts that a warm heart is the only prerequisite for cross-cultural ministry. Similarly, Evan Burns paints a picture of missionary theologians, men and women who are competent to express the historic Christian faith in new circumstances and cultures. Both of these proposals stress the indispensable work of language learning, a task in need of justification with the advent of better and better versions of Google Translate. I don't believe we can emphasize enough how Martin's linguistic competence opened doors for conversation and ministry. During his year in Persia, he would entertain guests that interrupted his translation work in order to have a conversation in Persian about Christianity. He gives no report of having an English-Persian interpreter with him during these visits. His ability to communicate made him an object of attention. And a Sufi scholar, a Sufi Muslim scholar, even published a tract against Christianity based on Martin's one year of witness in Shiraz. Martin then responded, while he's doing the New Testament, with three brief tracts in Persian that became standard texts for studying Muslim apologetics in the next decades. Henry Martin's education prepared him in the best way possible 
for the tasks of analysis and communication that were crucial for bringing the gospel to bear in new circumstances. We do not have to agree with the 19th century headmaster of Eton, who challenged his students that if they were not skilled in composing classical Greek poetry, quote, how can you ever be of use in the world? Okay, we don't have to go that far. I am not saying that composing original Greek poetry or examining students on Xenophon's Anabasis is the key to making one useful in God's service. But we can connect a rigorous attempt at renewing classical education today with the potential to produce gifted and tenaciously flexible missionaries. If parents or students are tempted to ask why they must study Latin, I wonder if a classical headmaster could respond so that they might become missionaries like Henry Martin. What we see in Henry Martin is a dogged determination to use his particular gifts to be spent in the encounter, to have little or no expectation of success, and to press on in faith. This was a tenacious flexibility that leaned into the help of colleagues and friends, that adapted to circumstances in order to display the gospel to whomever he encountered, and who demonstrated deep confidence in bringing the gospel to speech in both Urdu and in Persian. Now, had he lived 30 years longer, we may have seen some additional fruits, maybe a family, perhaps a native church established, perhaps an apologetic ministry in Muslim Persia. But if there was ever one who was poured out like a drink offering, who fought the good fight, finished the course, and kept the faith, it was he. And we do well to consider how to cultivate and encourage similar ministry today. Thank you. The microphone, yes. Hey, question time. What would be some questions? Content questions are very much acceptable in this. This is a new person for a lot of us. At the end there, you were talking about translation today and whether or not it is maybe strident enough or professional, or I'm not sure exactly how to word it, but you find that lacking. I was thinking when you, as you were speaking of like the efforts of Wycliffe or others like that, um, maybe you can comment on what you think where we're at these days. Yeah, and I don't, and so the, I, I wanted to point out there that out, what I meant was outside the professional translation agencies, okay, who are, who are very concerned for linguistic quality, uh, language, high degree of language competency is not a, a, the supreme value among a lot of people who go out into cross-cultural ministry. So, so I'm, I'm very much accepting the, the, the very linguistic-focused mission organizations that, that do mainly translation work. But it, so I'm speaking broadly of, of, of cross-cultural missions. Yeah, and that's, and that's the, the, the part I'd love to, love to address. And, yeah. and, and Henry Martin is such an example. Hey, John, I, I don't know if I caught, what was his motive for wanting to go back to Britain? Yeah, and, and, and do you think, uh, do, you, do you have an appreciation for that motive? Yes. So, he, he, does, not, he does not say it bluntly. Uh, the, the, the obvious reason he's traveling is because he is, he is sick. And in that time, right, there's, there's, they, they have no medical means of helping tuberculosis. And the, the idea is a change of climate might help, is what they're after. And so, in, in, in a sense, he could have gotten on a ship in, in India and sailed directly to England. And that would have been pretty, pretty standard procedure for those who were, uh, who, were, who were suffering in that way. He decided to go to Persia. In a sense, I think he meant to just drop off his translation and have it printed. And then, then, he, then he said, well, we've got to scrap this one and write a new one. He was invited to an inland city, 100 miles inland, as the only foreigner. He was there for a year, did the translation effort, then thought, well, now that I know the culture, actually I should give this, this book to the king, 
So, well, I got to get to him. He gets to the king. Then he's not allowed to have an audience. He's got to go find the British consul. All this time, he's, he's, he's dying from tuberculosis. And so, at this point, he, he decides to head to England, um, be, statedly because of his health. Secondarily, I, I think he wants to see Lydia, right? I think he wants to see Lydia Grenfell, and I think he has some expectations that maybe they could renew their acquaintance if he made it back to England. So, yeah. Unfortunately, this is one of the, the, the ways history works, but Lydia Grenfell also kept a very detailed journal, but she or her relatives destroyed all the parts that related to Henry Martin in, in 1812. So they actually published it, but it's not very exciting because it's all just her thoughts on life from other parts of her life. And uh, she never married. She didn't, she didn't live, um, she lived to be into her 30s or maybe to, to her 40s, but um, she, she was never married to anyone else. So, unfortunately, we don't get the, the other side of the story. We don't have her letters to Martin, either, to Henry Martin. Other thoughts or questions? You may have referenced it in, in terms of following all that you've shared with us, so if, if you did, I apologize, but um, Bronte's familiarity with him, what was that, what was its origin? Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, how, how did he, how does he make it into her writing? Yeah. yeah, so there are a couple lines of evidence for, for this. The, the first and big one is that the character's name is Sinjin, which of course is St. John. And Martin studied at St. John's College, Cambridge, the same college where Bronte's father studied at the same time. So Martin would have known Bronte's father. The, the other thing is that Sargent's biography of him was published four years after his death, and again, maybe 15 years before Charlotte Bronte wrote um, Jane Eyre. So it was widely known by the time she was writing. So the, that, that, those are the factors that lead people to say this is, this is, this is, a, this is an intentional connection. And people even... even um, in, you know, as I've found, even in the late 1800s, people will reference the connection between Charlotte, uh, 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 St. John Rivers and Henry Martin. But again, she never wrote anything about it. Question would be related to his service in the East India Company. Mm -hmm. um, so he's there for the purpose largely of ministering to Englishmen who are serving in the East India Company. He obviously engaged in some ministry beyond that. To what degree was that a matter of tension either to the East India Company or to the uh, indigenous people to which he was ministering? Yes, that's an excellent question. So to what extent was it, was it a, a tension? He, um, as long as he was fulfilling his Sunday duties and was available for weddings and baptisms, I, I, it seemed that the East India Company um, was not actively inhibiting his work with, uh, with, with, native pe with, with local people. In fact, he states that he has a, a great deal more freedom than do a lot of the other missionaries. So again, the, the, it's, it's crazy to think about this, but the main hindrance to missionary ministry in India in these years was the East India Company. So, so William Carey was, you know, was not allowed to settle down in, an East, in a company town at first. And so he, he, he lived in Serampur, which was a Danish colony, just 10 miles away from Calcutta. And he would travel there and be there, but he wouldn't, he wouldn't set up a mission in Calcutta for a long time until he, he was a part of the university there. So the, so the East India Company was believed that the missionaries would create social problems by, by stirring up opposition in the, uh, uh, among, among local uh, Indian people. And so, um, so in general, they looked down on it. But Martin, in a sense, had a free pass as a missionary, as a chaplain. So he could go anywhere along the India Company's um, areas where they were, th that they controlled, and, um, and nobody was watching out to see, figure out what he was doing. Yeah, so that gave him freedom. By the way, let, let me give you a quote on, on working for the East India Company, because I know there's an, there's an ethical thing here. So here, here's, how, here's how he does it. He talks about it. This is actually on his, um, his journey over to India. 
in his journal, he says this, quote, I know not how to decide. Thoughts occur to me. A man, and here's, here's the analogy he comes up with for working for the East India Company. A man who has unjustly got possession of an estate hires me as a minister to preach to his servants and pays me a salary. The money wherewith he pays me comes unjustly to him, but justly to me. The company are the acknowledged proprietors of the country and the ruling power, he says. Then he goes on, to, he continues and says, he would, need to think, he would need to think of the same situation. For instance, if he was invited to be chaplain in France at the time, when Napoleon, in his mind, is no legitimate empire, emperor. Okay? Or what if a company of Muslim princes were in possession of the land and they invited him to be chaplain? And so he decides, I can serve as chaplain even though I don't agree with the ruling government. So that's how he works through it himself. Yeah. You know, what's remarkable is that we wouldn't know of any of these guys, right? They would have zero impact on us at all if they hadn't written something down. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, I think it's or, I think it's and, others have written down about them. So you got Brainerd's journals and you got Edwards taking it. So the question seems to be, they, since they function as such amazing forces of inspiration, I mean, how many missionaries are on the field because of biography or autobiography? Sh should we encourage young people to keep journals? That mm -hmm. would be one way to ask the question. Then I had a follow-up, but Go with that one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, on the, the one thing I appreciate about, Brain, about Martin's journal is he's very clear that it is an introspective journal asking, you know, sort of giving himself an account before God. So a lot of it is very much, here's my, here's my sin, like this is what I'm repenting of today, and these sorts of things. When he gets into ministry, he does record more of, here's what I did each day. But, the, um, but I did really appreciate, especially his first four years of keeping the journal, it's very introspective. It's very concerned with my own spiritual growth. And so, yeah, absolutely, there is a, there's a call here to, to think through if it's worth um, recording our own spiritual life and growth in similar ways. Um, the other source we have for, for Martin that I think is helpful is that he did write a lot of letters. And, and I wish we could write letters like that today, but we don't. And I don't know what it would take to restore that given the, the, the ease of electronic communication. But his letters are the other source we have for, for, for most of these thoughts. Yeah, you want to follow up? To create the mindset of saving letters, if you get a letter, I mean, I've, I've like probably that. got nine bins in my attic of letters I have received. I don't throw anything away just because I think Somebody might want to know what somebody thinks someday. Um, I, here's the, I bet they will. No. <laughs> here's the second. Here's the second question. Um, we are so cautious about being hero worshippers. Mm -hmm. We we love anti heroes, and I just wonder if the pendulum might swing in the wrong direction because God has used some whitewashed heroes, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and so thoughts about worrying too much yeah. about exposing warts, which yeah. we all have. Um, yeah, that, maybe that's enough. That's a, that's a great question. And, and it is one, it's basically the topic of our missionary biography class, is how do we, how do we actually tell stories of missionaries when um, there, is a, there is a push toward, and, and a godly push toward hagiography, toward just giving, let's give it, show the work of God in this without any stains or blemishes, and our culture pushes us hard in the other direction. No, 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 tear down your heroes and show them on sort of equal footing with yourself. And so at least in this one with Henry Martin, the two, the two I, I wanted to point out to us, I, the, the danger I felt is that there, it is a moralizing from this figure rather than seeing him as a whole person and his, and his um, you know, involvement in redemptive history, his involvement in God's work, instead it picks, picks out parts of who he is or what he did and, and moralizes on that in ways that, that come across as, as ultimately well, moralizing or legalistic. So th th those are the danger I still want to be aware of even when, even when seeking to, to make much of somebody like this. Do you think Henry and Lydia would have ended up well together? Yeah, <laughs> that's a good question, yeah. What would have happened? 
Um, I, d- I think that if he had been in England or remained in England, there would have been no objections from her family and they most likely would have gotten married. I think that, I think that seems to be the way things would have gone. Um, you know, I read that quote for us because, from his, his journal about how he thought about Lydia. And, and I do think he probably would have had to learn some things in his marriage, right? <laughs> There's, I think he may have, he was a passionate man who, who saw, and, and in that at least instance, sort of saw a wife as a primarily one who could help make his ministry better rather than as a, as a partnership uh, together for, for the gospel. So maybe he would have learned some lessons. Any others? What others? Thank you, Dr. Hogan. That was awesome. Um, just curious if his um, classical education affected all the way in which he did apologetics, specifically talking about these philosophical questions, other kind of expansive nature um, questions. Um, do you see any uh, transcending that he did? You mentioned his three texts, um, mm-hmm. treatises being principles for later Muslim apologetics. How do you see that in connection to his classical education? What, is there any relation there? Is it different than what the Baptists were doing without, not, mm-hmm. not that Baptists aren't classical and amazing. Um, yeah, yeah. Praise the Lord, but. Yeah, well, and, and this would, and Mateo, this would, be a, this would be a worthwhile study further. We could try to understand better too the curriculum at Cambridge then. So besides the heavy Greek and Latin, you know, sort of foundations, uh, one of the, I don't, I don't have the name here, the, the, the philosophy textbook he examined in was not, say, the Summa Theologica, right? It was, a, it was a contemporary philosophical apologetic book from the late 1700s. And so it would be interesting to probe what were the kind of currents of apologetic thought that he would have learned from in Cambridge. So I'm not sure about that. In regard to what he actually did in Persia, the, the, the tracks he did are, are very much on the line of, of questioning the authority of the, of the Quran versus the Bible. So they would be along lines that would be pretty familiar to us, of, 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 but in a sense for some of the first time, right? A- addressing this by saying, in a sense to Muslim scholars, you're not taking the, his- the historicity of your own book seriously. And we are, and, and, and we can show that there's at least a greater probability to trust what's going on here than what's going on in your texts, and as a, as a way to at least answer the objections that he's hearing from Muslim, Muslim people there. So great question, though, about the, it'd be fun to explore more what the, what the curriculum at Cambridge would have looked like in 18, 18, 1800 to 1803. Yep. Thanks. Yeah, any others before we get done? Yeah, go for it. So I'm going to try to fill out an application and see if I can audit your missions biography class. Yeah, it's a little late, but you should can, I, you Well, can I was going to say, should I get turned down? Uh, I was going to say, could you, could you tell us maybe one or two biographies you'd recommend some of us to check out, and perhaps one or two of the more well-known ones, and then maybe more like one or two of the Henry Martins, maybe people we're not aware of, we wouldn't think to read. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, that's a great question. I, I'm, I don't claim to be an expert on all the missionary biographies that are out there. The lists are, the lists are pretty solid. We, and, and, and again, what we're doing in the class is not necessarily representative of the best ever, because also we're, we're reading to be t- t- different sorts of characters who would be interesting in different ways. So um, the ones we're reading for this class, the four main ones and then some subsidiary, secondary texts, are, are Henry Martin, then we, we read a number of different things from Hudson Taylor. So Hudson Taylor has a really easy, t- uh, re- in retrospect, autobiography, and then there are a number of later biographies of him. Um, then, then we're reading um, Amy Carmichael, I mean, Elizabeth Elliot's version of Ca- Amy Carmichael called A Chance to Die, and then, um, the, and then uh, Shadow of the Almighty by Elizabeth Elliot about uh, um, Jim Elliot. So those are the four we're, we're looking at for that particular class. One, one interesting person that's come up in the class that, that uh, I've, I enjoyed looking at was, was the account of Raymond Lull, who's a, who's a medieval scholar who uh, lived on the Mediterranean and dreamed his whole life in a sense of doing Muslim evangelism. He learned Arabic, 
And in the midst of all sorts of other philosophical debates and books he was writing, he decided, I'm going to do evangelism on the southern coast of the Mediterranean. And he went, and he was kicked out twice, maybe three times, spent a long time in, in, in Europe. And then when he was in his 80s, he decided to go back and preach and was killed. And that was his, uh, the end of his life. So this life spent in a very unique form of, of attempting to do Muslim evangelism. So that's one we, we, we looked at uh, through, a, through a, a medieval text, his, uh, his, his own sort of um, uh, recollections about that. So. Yep, thanks. Okay. Let's thank John Hoagland for tonight's lecture. Yeah, thanks.